this is the Dawn of Everything Chapter One uh, Book Circle uh, meeting for Tuesday. Uh, and Thursday, we'll have the, the next one, or Wednesday and Friday for Wendy. Um, <laughs> welcome all. Uh, I think you've probably seen the, I, I set up an agenda. We don't have to follow it, but we can. Um, so let me grab that URL again. I'll be absolutely honest. I haven't reread chapter one because it. I started pretty much when the book came out. So now it's a bit... Uh, <laughs> A bit far. Uh, I'll be honest. I haven't finished chapter one, but for the oh. first time. But... Well, uh, my honesty thing is I've listened to it, but I'm finding um, reading it a new, a different experience because each time I pick up something different. And so usually I listen to something as I walk, which means I process it differently because I'm walking in nature. Ken? I'm, I'm right there with you, Wendy. I have listened to it. Um, and uh, I don't have a, a Kindle or a physical copy, so all I have is audio recall, which is generally fair for me, but um, because I did listen to it a couple weeks ago, it's not the freshest thing in my mind. But, um, but I'm raring to talk about the book and just, you know, what's being brought up. I'm very excited to be with you all because I love, I have been part of a book group for a long time and I find it really helps me absorb the book way better than if I just read it on my own. So thank you all for being here. Likewise, mm -hmm. um, let me, uh, I, I don't want to break our flow here, but but let me screen share the, um, the agenda I've got set up, which includes a most important part, which is review and adjust agenda as attendees see fit. Um, well, I want to, do we really have to be humans when we check in? We can't, you know, take on our <laughs> totem animal. <laughs> I'm totally cool if it's a totem animal thing, man. Um, uh furries forever uh I, what forever so, uh furries ah furries forever, furries yes. furries forever okay so <laughs> it is actually relevant totems i mean i know i'm riffing off something i've read from somewhere else but you know we, we're going to go this place i think if we're going to make all this stuff useful we've got to integrate it with other books so when you say did you say fur is forever Furries. Yeah. I said furries forever. Okay. <laughs> furries forever. Um, because um, I don't know, I'm deviating to another book, but Tyson Yaktapura in the first opening chapters of his book say that the echidnas have it. And my totem's always been the echidna. So I thought, right, I'm, I'm up there already. It's really good. <laughs> anyway, Tyson Yaktapura, who's an um, an Indigenous academic in Australia. Um, and I've been reading, I read the two books together is my point. I think I'm influenced by things that come from more than one place. And that's really important. These conversations sort of bring up other places that we can integrate our stories with. Um, because it's a very grand narrative that the Davids uh, um, are telling. Um, but I was drawn to listening to a sort of current Indigenous version at the same time, because I think the history there is an active one. Um, and while it's not in the, the record in the way that um, is in Dawn of Everything, I think it's coherent because it's been recorded in other ways. So we can draw on current history, not, but as recorded through, you know, song lines and other forms of um, storytelling. I also read Braiding Sweetgrass at the same time as well, just to make life tricky. <laughs> um, and Jack is interested in Ministry for the Future. Oh, I don't know that one. I've read ah. that one. I've read, I've read, I'm in the middle of Sand Talk. I've read the Ministry of the Future and I read Breeding Sweetgrass. And um, I just want to throw out uh, something I posted to the OGM list last week. Um, Bio Akomalafe um, is from Nigeria and was uh, taught at Schumacher College. Brilliant man. Just really lovely listening to him. And he's also all about indigenous wisdom. So I feel very much like Wendy where these things are, are, um, coalescing for me and I've, they seem to be clustering. So 
I have a hard time sometimes saying, did I read that in the Dawn of Everything? Was that part of Sand Talk? Or, you know, they all sort of mush together, which is just the way my brain is working these days. Everything feels mushy in there. And and I've got a, a, another mushy thing that Pete and I are involved in. So not only do I have these um, narratives that are written in book and different um I guess histories that or different ways that history has been recorded that they've used as their sources. What I also have is four yarns that have um, been created and they're indigenous that weavings, if you like, between um, Asia Pacific or mainly um, Australia, New, New Zealand, um, Papua New Guinea as a region and Wales. And these are spoken discourse, and I'm not all the way through, but we've got the transcripts for all of them, and they're becoming web pages. Pete and I are making them into web pages, so these are spoken, and they're um, intersectional. Oh dear, <laughs> are they intersectional? <laughs> but you know, things like mining and other bits and pieces come up as rich topics. You know, really contested issues. Um, so I think acknowledging who's in the room is really important, not just the four of us, but you know, these other influences that are influencing our thinking so we can name them. Thanks. Is, is that you, Ken? Or, or that was me. Talk? Thank you, Ken. Um, I was going to ask you how to spell his name. Um, yarning is a, a uh, Indigenous practice in Australia, actually. So there's a, there's a thousands of years of back history between uh this uh this thing. and and what i'm also revealing um because it came up in the first yarn because i had to say what yarning is yarning is actually a culture it's been given the name yarning in australia not because an indigenous person picked up that word but because it reflects a practice in australian culture around a chat if that makes sense a sort of informal backwards banter backwards and forwards so it's also, quite weirdly, although I don't think that this has been discussed discussed um, at a national level, but I think it soon will be. Um, it's a crossover between what you call a settler use of a word which is to do with weaving, if you like, and an Indigenous practice which is around having a conversation in a circle. And there's not just one form, there's about seven forms of them. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to um, hijack our conversation. I'm just saying that the minute you take a word, any word, and put it into a culture, any culture, it evokes all these intersectional things. <laughs> so what I'm saying is the word yarn, Y-A-R-N, did not turn up in Aboriginal language, but it's something that has been done in Australia for the longest time in many formats, some of which have been more coll colloquial and since sort of settler times, you know, 1780, um, but is now increasingly being, I won't say appropriated, gathering momentum as a way of signaling important discussions slash conversations slash exchanges slash dialogue slash whatever you want to use for when words go backwards and forwards between people <laughs> and a yarn doesn't necessarily and this is important a yarn doesn't necessarily have a very specific intention it's emergent so i guess that's me finishing for the moment <laughs> i actually just read this this morning Yarning is more than just a story or conversation in Aboriginal culture. It is a structured cultural activity that is recognized even in research circles as valid as a valid and rigorous methodology for knowledge production, inquiry, and transmission. It's a ritual that incorporates elements such as story, humor, gesture, and mimicry for consensus building and innovation. It references places and relationships in a highly contextualized local worldviews of those yarning. Um, and it goes on and on, but it's... Uh, what I thought was very interesting is that there's no talking stick protocol. That was uh, appropriated yes. from Western Native American culture. Um, and, and usually the senior people are the ones who will bring anybody back who tends to wander off, but not always. Sometimes they also get 
get there. So I, I love Tyson's style because he's he was very, very human in terms of the way he writes. There's no I'm above you. It's like, hey, we all screw up and you know, uh, just this is what I'm I'm sharing. So it's been very sweet to read. Oh, it is good. Um and I'm you know, I'm getting to know him personally, like literally personally, because he's sort of in my backyard, so to speak. Oh great. Um yeah, so that's all and, and a conversation happened two days ago around that. So I guess, I guess if we were sweeping back to um, the Davids, um, and I'm I'm going to be really, I'm going to I'm going to make a really weird suggestion here. I reckon that we could get David Gray, um, Wengro to come and visit this group when we're sort of tossed around things for a long time. Let's have. I would like to set that intention because I think that we would, you know. We were a really interesting and reflective group. I think that that would be, I, I, if I was someone like that who'd written and with a co-author who's no longer around, um, a book like this, intending to change things, I think we should ask him. Maybe not straight away. I think that we're, we've got a lot to offer um, and a lot of people are not gonna sit down and write 10, 10 years worth of a book that calls on however many decades of a career or several careers and everybody else's has contributed to the book. But, you know, these books are written to change things. And if we're people who want to change things and we want to learn from this book, then we should be inviting the people who are involved in writing that process um, and, and, and ask them questions. Can you please put in the notes, um, Ken, that quote, where you got that quote from? Is it from... Yeah, that's, 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 it's off my Kindle. I just was telling Pete, he was looking for it on his, uh, I said, try yarning as more than just a story. Um, uh, I, you know, I think all... I found that, that one. But it's from Santoc. Yeah, it is from Santoc, yes. Oh, okay, then, then, that, then that's me um, not going reading it a second or third time or not reading it in print. And I'm trying to resist buying that's physical books. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we will, we will, we are setting up something for the middle of us, middle of the year with Dave Snowden. So let's not focus on sand talk, but I'm saying that books like that are highly relevant because they're referring to the history that David's writing about, but they, that history has been captured in a different way, evoking parts of the land as, you know, embodied knowledge, um, and passing it on through story and oral culture. So it's as if the um, antecedents of all the stuff that the two Davids talk about in, um, and increasingly I want to be thinking about David Wengro because he is accessible. Um, those stories have actually been captured and they are live and they are around and we can inquire about them. And even though they're not stones that you can pick up and look at, and they're not pictures that have been drawn on walls, although sometimes they are, you know, that seems to me a really valid point to come back to. And I don't know that that was actually made in the book. Now I think about it, not in the way that I feel now that it could be. Um, interesting. This has been really cool. Um, I want to look back at the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I messed it up completely. <laughs> well, no, not at all. It, we've done. We're an emergent perfect. force. <laughs> um, the the the. I guess I, there are two main things I want to make sure that we do. Uh, one of them is talk about chapter one. Although if we don't, it's totally fine. The other one I want to do is make sure that we we do a retro and take notes. And I, I recommend a plus delta retro, although we could use a different format. Um, uh, and then if we want to talk about chapter one, it would be nice to, to figure out how to talk about chapter one. So first of all, does this, does this seem silly that we should just talk about chapter one or is that a, a good goal in, in a meeting like this? And, and I can frame it a little bit more Chapter one, it's is pretty introductory, and it's, I, you know, it's kind of, I don't know if it's, but on the other hand, 
we're just getting <clears throat> used to being together. We're, we're getting used to doing this in two meetings, uh, which is another uh, trick that we're learning together with the other team. Um, I expect to be there this week. Um, so I, I felt like it wasn't actually a bad thing to, to talk about chapter one uh, re with some reasonable intention of actually talking about it and then being better at doing chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. So for better or for worse, the way that the we've kind of structured the book club or the way I've suggested we structure the book club and nobody disagreed <laughs> um, was uh, um, to go through chapters and to do it at a fairly deliberate pace. Um, I, I know a few of us, I think maybe most of us thought a deliberate pace was kind of a good thing. So, you know, the weird thing is we've got two weeks to kind of digest maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after this meeting, I don't know. Um, but we've kind of got two weeks to digest chapter one. Part of that, I think we should just do some practice, getting used mm. to how we talk about practice one mm. or chapter one, how we do retros, how we, you know, whether we're good or not about taking notes. Um, so that's my my pitch. Now, even that pitch, forty five minutes seems like too long for that. Um, um, well, I do from a process point of view. I think it's really important to reflect on. You know, audio recall, I, I mean, I just bought this morning, 15 minutes before this meeting, the um, Kindle version, so they could go back and mark some quotes. So to me, the process that we use, you know, the, the artifact that we're using to work from, um, and th this is just how I think, it's been my whole career really, is the physical art artifacts actually shape how you can work with other people and how you work with yourself. And how you structure your knowledge and such because you can i can actually now look at the exact quote <laughs> without having to look at the screen i can think right i had that thought you know i put that note in um so at the moment i'm just i'm i'm just going through chapter one and i'm looking at where other people have noticed things so you know idyllic state of equality that's a quote <laughs> so you know, really was that the way it was. I haven't I haven't experienced that throughout my life generally, but you know, some from time to time you experience it. So I'm just wondering, was it so different before, you know? Idyllic state of equality is a, is much of a um it's a provocation almost as a phrase, really, isn't it? Is any is that from chapter <laughs> one? Yeah, it's in chapter one. Um, it says, you know, what if instead of telling a story about how our species fell from some idyllic state of equality, we ask how we came to be trapped in such tight conceptual shackles that we can no longer imagine the possibility of, of reinventing ourselves? The, the, the whole, just before we, we jump into the sentence, but but I do think we we should... <clears throat> what you're saying, Pete, is it's uh, the chapter one is uh, very introductory. I did speed read while we were talking, uh, just to remind myself what was in chapter one, as opposed to subsequent chapters, since it's been a while. And yeah, it's very much setting the stage for the whole book. And it will be very mm -hmm. hard for me to speak about chapter one without speaking about the yeah. whole book. Uh, no spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> Is it for real, Ken, or, or? No, no, I'm just joking. You can, I, I'm, I've read different outtakes, different interviews and stuff. So I, I have little patches here and there. I'm just. Uh, for, for some books, you would want to say no spoilers, but well, I think. Well, yeah, if it was a novel, you know, yeah. uh, Rosebud was his sled, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, there is a story there. And I, I, I almost feel drawn to share it. It's about the words and the meaning of words. Um, and we could. I, I don't know about that story, Wendy. What was that? <laughs> I don't it's know about that story. particular story. And you don't don't want that. No, we don't know. We don't mean this meeting, but I'm just saying be, beware the meaning of a word is my point. <laughs> and if, and you guys should all laugh, but I use it as an example, and I then I understand why it's so vexing as an example of the meaning of word. It was like a game within a game. So anyway, <laughs> let's assume uh, you know the writing style I loved at the beginning, um, partly because I know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and 
the person who was reading it had that sort of British voice and the phrasing and everything is along that sort of rice style of, you know, it, it's got a lot of style of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I would love to understand why that was adopted, but there's a lot of similarity. <laughs> I did not recognize this influence. Uh, my reading of the Hitchhiker is also dates, I guess, but there is certainly the basic wry mm. humor. It's very wry. It's very wry. Yeah, 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 that was the word I was going to use. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's there. It's the 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 the, the wry humor, a kind of vaguely sardonic uh, <laughs> stance is there. I agree totally. I, I don't know if yeah. Hitchhikers is my prime example of that, but I see it. Um, do, do, do you think, though, that that um, indicates, because I don't know David Graeber, you know, I know he lived in different places, um, but, you know, in my mind, when someone reads a book um, on um, Audible or whatever, I start to infer things about where they come from in their own histories. And I didn't even know to say that thing now, but there's something about the format that I'm reading it in, which is actually influencing how I think about the book, what I infer about the person and what their history is, which I think is actually naughty, but actually also relevant at the same time. Well, it, 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 it could be because I, I read it on Kindle, so that means I don't have the voice that you had reading hmm. it so there's a certainly a level of Britishness that I didn't uh, impart the text with. <laughs> but and humor, I think, is really important because I think the humor, I think, is there. Yeah, I could I, see it in text. Yeah, and I think there's something here about us making fun of ourselves. You know, what were we thinking that you could actually dig up some stones and tell all these stories with all the missing parts? And he raises this later on in the book, you know, the idea, and this is where women often come in because he's talking about soft technologies and things that, that decay and you have to infer that they exist, but the stones still exist. And therefore you can read the stones, but not the soft things that decay. Um, and it's, it just shows you about the architecture of knowledge, you know, what's permanent, what isn't permanent, what can you believe you can work from um, so I'd love to understand more about the dialogue that happened between the Davids. It makes me deeply curious. And I'm just reading, I, re I read again the prologue to the book, because that's where you start when you get the words, I guess. And it was David Wengro writing about the writing process. And he said, and know that I'm also reading the book dialogue at the same time. So I'm, I'm saying more than one thing. It was something about the exchange over time. And he was saying how their thinking actually became a thinking of one person, it was David squared over time because they did exchanges over a whole decade. Um, and that's a lot of exchange, especially, you know, if towards the end you're having three or four conversations a day, quite often you complete each other's thoughts if you're that entwined. Ken, I'm curious about what you think because you've always got very insightful thought. What about this? Uh, I don't know much about David Wengro. I can, I've been re reading, uh, rereading, uh, no, reading another of David's books, David Graeber's books. And so I'm looking at the difference in tone, but the other book is more a pamphlet. Well, this one also has a bit of a pamphlet quality, but it's a pamphlet very much balanced by erudition. The other which, one is- also, Which book, Mark Antoine? the um, utopia of rules ah i've not read that but i'm driven to doing it it's it's absolutely delightful uh oh. no no it's it's uh, graber is wonderful right but uh, utopia of rules is a huge well this is the the one where uh david boville is said that you know he's being on uh, it's a it's a bit it's a bit sad that the social scientists didn't do more with computers, which I understand where he's coming from. Uh, and I don't want to discuss that, but I think it's a bit unfair in some ways, but fair in others, for sure. But certainly there's the same humor. David Graeber had a lot of humor. Mm. Uh, 
I read uh, another book of his, The Democracy Project. So that's what I read of him. Um, and there's always this theme of possibility. And that's the overarching mm. theme, right? Throughout this book. And I would say his whole oeuvre, the notion that we have choice, we can create things, we can imagine things. The theme of, of active social imagination is also very present in the utopia of rules. Uh, mm. And we can imagine things to be otherwise. And this is what human agency is. And yeah. the here, I mean, Dawn of Everything is very much taking issue with a particularly reducting tale of humanity's growth. Mm. Um, but the basic theme is it's particularly reducting because, reductive, I guess, uh, well, and reducting also, because there's so much more that's possible, that has been possible, that has happened. That, And, and, and what I do like, sorry, I'll talk a bit about the content in two minutes. What I do like about this book is it's not, it's not utopian in the sense mm -hmm. that it's not saying here was the perfect society, let's simulate it. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, but it's very much about describing all those societies with their pros and cons and, but saying, you know, these were people who said, you know, this doesn't work for us, let's do something else. Um, and that's the recurring message in the book. Uh, all these things exist. That's the, and you know, an example of this and an example of that, an example of this, and forget that pattern, here's a counter example. And, but also seeing there was human agency involved, yeah. in, including what is fascinating in societies that lasted for millennia. Um, so agency is a huge, huge theme. So I don't know what's when what when Grow's voice is in there, because mm. the theme is very uh, many themes are recognized between many of his books, at least the theme of human agency, and the the right humor I also recognize. Mm. Uh, and your edition is there in the other books, by the way. I don't want to imply that they don't have it, but it's less. The other, like Utopia of Rules and Democracy Project, are more pamphlets and less, uh, you know, studies. And that way, I'm, I, sh I will, I'm very curious to read Depth because Depth is making an argument like mm. Dawn of Everything is. And I'm curious to see, and I'm sure there's the same kind of impeccable scholarship because the scholarship is there. But this is a very interesting book in that it's, it's drawing the line between expanding the possible and making us imagine, but also saying, well, concrete example, reference. It's, it's, it's very solid. Like I made sure I didn't skip a footnote. Uh, mm. There's a wealth in the footnotes. I don't know how wow. that comes out in the audiobook. Uh, they're probably not there. And my goodness, there's stuff there. <laughs> wow, there's so much in what you were saying. Um, I'm drawn to two things. Pete, can you just make a note about a book called The Sociological Imagination? And I'm going to go back to that book, um, mainly because it was very useful in my, in my doctorate. But I think this idea of firstly, realizing that people were experimenting is the, the basic thesis, is, is, is this active agency and searching the ING so you're interesting, it was really interesting hear you, hearing you, Marc-Antoine, talk about reductive and re reducting. I think that it's still a process that we're trying to do, not so much in this, in this conversation, I think we're still in an open space, but this idea of this permission, this declaration in some ways that it's by keeping things in verbs, keeping this exchange going, that we learn together and it's really essential to, to acknowledge the fact, and I think Graeber makes this point really, really clearly, clearly that all of all of humanity's, you know, the, all of time has been experimenting with nature and experimenting between people around how 
you live in a place and at a time and with other people and that worked out well or badly <laughs> um so if you look at it, it look at it that way it's trying to understand what experiments were run and are they still running you know in in certain civilizations and how are they being renegotiated so this imagination going forwards about what you could learn from what has gone before and what are your possibilities now and i know in an australian culture it's really fragmented you know this co-ownership of land is something that will hopefully turn up when I, I it is actually there in the book in multiple places it's not introduced at the beginning but this idea of the commons of land not just the commons of it if you think about it but the commons of land that existed before enclosure and this has come up in the yarns is a, a hugely divisive thing that you know this person owns this this bit of land and that person doesn't own this bit of land um that's a topic i'd love us, us to take further because it's a it's deeply rooted in how we live now this i own this you don't own this <laughs> Um, and James Cass, I think we probably need to somehow weave in somewhere here because he's got a very big piece around property and it's turning up a lot in the yarns and mining and all these other, you know, if you say extractive processes. Um, but should we circle back to things that we can notice from the first chapter just to be honouring the moment? Because we're sort of setting the scene in some ways, throwing other rocks in the pond. I've got an odd, odd thing to say about chapter one. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, well, so now having not read the whole book, I don't know. If, I, I have a question about the whole book, which I, is, I'm happy to have it resolved uh, over time. The um, I, I like that the, the Davids said, you know, there was a lot of variety throughout history. Um, and uh, Hobbes and Rousseau, you know, kind of, and I think they make the point that Rousseau wasn't, was actually saying, you know, I'm just doing a thought experiment here, don't take this as gospel. And then we kind of narrowed down into making it gospel. But anyway, they, they did this reductive thing, you know, that, that sometimes we do, um, and made all of history very reductive. You know, there's a hierarchy of evolution to human history. And this is how it works, even though they didn't have any, um, they, they didn't do a statistical analysis. They didn't have, you know, the, the data to, to show that or anything. And if you look at the data, there's a much different story. So I get all that. I appreciate all that. The thing that, that I was left hanging and wanting was for them to say, and it could have just been a, a, a short sentence even, we could have ended up in a different future. The, the future that we have now is one of many that could have happened. Mm. And so when I was reading that and reading about Rousseau and Jared Diamond and um, Steven Pinker and, and Hobbes and what they end up thinking, I'm like, you know, the reason those, those men end up thinking that is because they ended up in one cul-de-sac of all the futures that we had. And of course, that the, the backstory from where they are now, the backstory is, you know, there's good guys and bad guys and we fight wars and, you know, and it's all about men and whatever, you know, whatever the story is, they're coming from a particular place at the end of what should have been a multi-branch tree. And, and they, they didn't capture that. They didn't say, I, I wish they would have said one sentence, we could have had a matriarchal society or we could have had an egalitarian society. And they we do don't. They do say it we later. This one. They, do. they do say it. They do. Very Thank much. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Spoiler alert. No, no, no spoiler alert. But <laughs> ah! <laughs> I'm also out of here. here. I'm super glad to see. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to go find a different future. <laughs> they're very much saying, and, and, and we can keep deciding. Like they, they keep saying, yeah. you know, what we have is what we ended up with. And it's up to us to decide otherwise. I mean, this is this is Graeber's 
theme throughout. I mean, he's an anarchist for Christ's sake. He believes another world is possible. I mean, this is the ultimate anti-Tina, right? <laughs> there yeah. are alternatives. There's plenty alternatives. Uh, the, what's the acronym of that? <laughs> I'll have... Well, as a futurist, <laughs> and I can actually say that, um, it, it was the starting point. And that's why I was talking about the sociological imagination and dialogue, because this is sort of a collective dreaming. And I guess the irony of this in, in Australia of having, you know, the dreaming in the dream time is to be able to have these artifacts that you can reimagine currently and still get value from that don't determine exactly how the past happened, although there's, there's a game around that. It is a story and that you can use to feed forwards and it's not prescriptive. It's not saying it will end up as X, but there's learning in them. And there's something about not saying it happened exactly this way in the past because you can't know and you can't say it's going to happen this way in the future because you can't know. But the current time has got the ingredients that you can weave from if you can recognize them. So there's something about imagining together in, in recognizing the ingredients that you have now to work with, which are a subset of all the ones that you might have had, you know, based on what was possible in a period of time in the past. You know, we're still at the moment, and this is, I think, this is the thing I feel sad and angry about is that you know we're destroying so much of the nature that would be really useful to have you know available to us to reweave what we want to do but i look at places like the united kingdom where um and i can't remember where i read this i'm having that same problem um you know you, you look at the united kingdom and you could say it's possible that no part of that is remains unchanged like that it's possible that no part of that is as it was originally over time untouched. Um, you can't say that about Australia, but rapidly we're moving that direction. And Brazil is moving that direction and some of these places are. And so we've not got the, the ingredients that nature gave us to work with as ingredients. We're, we're sort of expending them now and, and you run out of runway in terms of the things that were called upon in the past um to create you know natural remedies and shelter and all those things they're not around so much in the way they were in some countries they're more available in some countries they're not available at all and here's a story we had a student in our household um who the week before last said to me i'm in a town in my country in china and I only live in tall buildings. I don't see trees. And she's in rural China. She doesn't see trees. She doesn't have grass in her city. It's not something that's part of her life. That's a big difference in terms of what we've got to work with compared, you know, historically. We don't have the materiality that was the source of a lot of the wisdom and the, the strength and the set of possibilities. We have other forms of material that don't, they actually come, a lot of them come from, you know, natural materials, you know, the braiding sweetgrass is all about braiding sweetgrass, and it's also telling a story. <laughs> no, I was in Shanghai in um, 07, and I had previously seen this wonderful documentary called Shanghai Ghetto, which was about the Jews who escaped the Nazis and ended up in Shanghai. And so there was plenty of historical footage of what Shanghai looked like in the 1930s and 40s. And um, I got to Shanghai in 2007, just in time to see the last dozen blocks of that being raised. You could see the old city there. And all around it were towering skyscrapers. And I thought to myself, how traumatic for people who had been born and raised in that city to see their entire city in the space of 20 years go from a beautiful, you know, low skyline, maybe three, four story buildings were the max, to this towering, I want to say towering inferno, a towering inferno of concrete and no green space anywhere. And their entire, everything they knew, everything had been changed. It, it was all wiped out and gone. There was no more natural space around. Um, and I recently encountered, I think it was from Sandtalk, PASS, post-apocalyptic, uh, 
stress, traumatic sense, stress syndrome of when people under, when a whole people undergo a huge trauma like that, um, whether it's the Holocaust or uh, Armageddon in terms of, of indigenous peoples or, you know, people having their entire city wiped out in the space of a generation, um, that leaves a very deep, um, very deep uh, PASS, I think is what it's called, Pete. Um, <laughs> So no I, I, you just you just stirred that for me and and yeah I very much agree the the land base I also from sand talk the first uh, the primal the the original sin for Aboriginal people is putting yourself above um, uh, the land or other people and we have an entire worldview that's built on we're separate from the world and um, yeah. Alan Watts called it the uh, the porcelain model. God made this earth and then he placed man on it and said, have dominion, go out there and you know do whatever you want. And and now we're learning from our modern, most modern science is catching up with our most ancient wisdom. The world is alive and we need to be treating it as alive. And we've killed off enormous parts of it that are not able currently to regenerate our lifestyle, our, our, our systems of living. And that's an ever narrowing set of walls, like the trash compactor in Star Wars. You know, the, 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 it's getting really tight in here, folks. <laughs> yeah. I don't, well, yeah, go on. I don't want to get too much into spoiler territory where he goes about states taking all the plates. But something that is very much uh, this, the fact that there's no space outside the current paradigm, right? There's no, uh, there used to be, you know, mountain ranges, and I'm looking for a word right now, there's, there's, there's some leftist essayist who wrote something about, you know, these mountain ranges where you'd have these people living outside of quote unquote civilization, Zuma, something like that. Uh, I wish I remembered that word, but there's this notion that there's always these kind of no man's land where people can try something else. Uh, and now there's no space that is not owned by a country on a map, right? Uh, and it was to be so important to be able to just precisely move around and try something else. Uh, mm. and, and that that is difficult. And you know, you said earlier, where is that space of experimentation? And I put a note in the text that I think it's now happening outside of state structures because it has to. And usually outside used to mean physically outside of state boundaries. But now that there's no outside, we have something else. Uh, I have a lot of objections to uh, what's happening in the DAO space, but it's still people experimenting with other forms of organization in another space alt altogether. There's uh, the commons people are experimenting. You know, there's all these communities trying to think, okay, what is human regulation uh, outside of this one paradigm? Yeah, it's really interesting um, the, the fact that I've got these four yarns to call on because a lot of what is discussed in those is very much feeling for, um, uh, I guess, the intersections between a lot of the themes we're talking about and it's only just hinted on and and they're you know they're, they're bound they're 90 minute talks so um but the third space is a phrase and i think that it's something that we should introduce in here so third spaces um are intersectional they're sort of stolen or reclaimed if that makes sense from a conversation that's gone to a particular shape but they're you know they're the charities so there's and other um you know not-for-profits other organizations that have the basic structures they require to be able to trade in one world in in order to allow another world to trade and then there's also a sort of it's not a formal economy but there's movements like permaculture which are deeply useful um in in, in that everyone has to eat so you can use them as sort of like a a basis on which to build other things and it can't be owned by someone although permaculture actually has a strong australian has strong australian roots i know who are people who are deeply involved in this who are also deeply involved in third space type um more traditional in, uh, businesses and such but the thing i really wanted to talk about is um something that turned up for me in a job interview it was actually part of a job interview over the last fortnight 
which is um, the idea of second order cybernetics and everything as objects. And um, the person who was championing that was a guy called Ranulph Glanville, R-A-N-U-L-P-H Glanville. And he was one of the um, sort of second staging, if you like, of cybernetics, which started in the 1940s. But here's the point. Um, it's really difficult to be able to reweave things if humans have, you know, primacy. It just can't work very well because if I'm more important than the rock or that's sort of like I could live with that, but if I'm more important than the plant that feeds me, we have a problem. <laughs> if I get rid of all the plants because it's easy for me to get rid of all the plants, I've got nothing to eat. So the, the idea of second order cybernetics, and I actually had to use an example to do to teach this. So I used Yoko Ono's um, exhibition in 1966 called Ceiling Painting. And I don't know if you know it, but she puts a ladder up and then she writes a word on a canvas on the ceiling in tiny writing. The ladder actually turned up later, funnily enough. It was a, a stolen ladder she painted white. She took it from a neighbor, but that's another story. And then she invites John Lennon, who doesn't know her at that point, to the exhibition. He's a, a, an influential random, it's an exhibition that happened, a pre-exhibition exhibition in a gallery in London. And she wrote the word yes, because she wanted to have more, positiv more positivity in her life. But the person who was sends the ladder does not know what is written at the top. So John Lennon goes up, he says the word yes, and you know, we know history, we know where John and Yoko went. And the word imagine came out of that meeting. And there's a lot of powerful things. And the song imagine came out of that meeting, but it was just one person evoking one word on a, ce a ceiling. But anyway, the point I'm making is that the minute you walk into that space with the ladder, you are part of that system. And I use that to get the second order cybernetics idea across that we are actually objects in observing systems. And this is the point that Glanville makes. And if you turn yourself into an object in an observing system, you don't play the game of being outside and being able to look at it as having higher order knowledge. You then actually have a, a landscape that can move because I can look at myself and say, what can the rock tell me about what's going on? What can the plant tell me about what's going on? So all of a sudden you have a system that can move because I'm not more important than the rock. In my asking, I'm saying rock, you know, what's try and be a rock. This is a really deeply indigenous thing. You can be the rock. You can be the plant. It's really hard for me to turn myself into a rock, but I can sort of look at things from a rock like perspective. Anyway, my point is that this object and being an observing being actually inside the machine and not unique as an observer, but more um, in as an observer who's observing themselves. It's a really funny thing to be in. Once you're on the ladder and part of that system and everything else is part of that system, then you have a way of reweaving the perspectives because you're not boss. You're not boss anymore. You're not the most important thing in that system. The, um, um, and that's really important. Hmm. My, my first encounter with a critique of objectivity was uh, Evelyn Fox Keller's Reflections on Gender and Science. Wow. Uh, absolutely fascinating analysis of objectivity as a defining myth of a certain vision of science. And she spent a lot of her life trying to say, what is a science that is not as objective, detached, uh, the, the, and, and she even puts it in relation with certain psychoanalytic theory of uh, psychic development. And I remember reading another feminist theorist saying that when you, they did this big survey of uh, how people describe knowledge and their experience of knowing. And they noticed that men were systematically using sight metaphors and women were systematically using hearing metaphors. Mm. I heard this. <laughs> it's, it's, it was very fascinating. Uh, wow. And now this is not exactly quoted by Keller, but still there is a lot about objectivity as a psychic construct of mm. a certain family structure and so on. 
and the origins, the toxic origins of that in, in this power over nature. Anyway, totally another book. <laughs> Um, yes, that one. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's interesting that how how much we place. It's interesting how much context we place this book in. Mm. <laughs> place it in a lot of context. Is that surprising as a statement, though? Just think about it. I mean, what's taken us this group to this place? It's not su surprising to me. I mean, it was sense making. It was. Um, conversation it was story it was a doctorate and a whole journey of things and Marc Antoine and 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 you know Ken and and Pete you know we've got five or six decades <laughs> of experience that have taken us to this point just like the Davids had to you know similar amounts of experience that took them to the same time and place um that's a yeah, lot I'm of conversation I'm not surprised but but um but when I, you know, when I've talked to people around me and I say, oh, I, I, we're starting a book club, it's like, oh, okay. And they, they think of a book club maybe a little bit differently than we're experiencing a book club. <laughs> and they think of their book, actually the book that they're reading. And, and, and that's the, the, the interesting thing for me. You know, it's like, oh yeah, we read that book. It was great. Um, but we're reading a book and, exploring a whole conceptual space or like a very rich, you know, multi-conceptual space. Yeah. This, is, this is like a, um, an OGM call on steroids where, you know, look how much, how many pages are on this, uh, this document already of all these different links and ways of looking. And we, we really haven't even talked about the book. We're just talking about the way it, <laughs> the book fits into our existing models and paradigms and, you know, um, uh, and and this is why I love uh, being part of a book group because um, and you're not just looking at the book. You look at what does it mean to this person and that person, and you get all these different. It's like the facets of a jewel. Each it just keeps lighting up again and again, and I find it so enriching. Um, and and I I want to say I, I realize we skipped over. I made a joke. We skipped over the check-in part as humans, and I I actually miss that so. <laughs> I don't know if we want to go back to that. Nothing says we have to do beginning, middle, and end in order. We can we can stick the middle into the beginning, or in, the, we stick the in, beginning into the middle. So. Course, in in my mind, we did the check-in as humans uh, for for five or ten minutes at the beginning, um, and it was on not on the recording. And right, and it's about the headphones. <laughs> yeah, it was about headphones and stuff. But you know, we got into as we situate ourselves, kind of. Um, and I actually reflecting on it i was thinking forward into the agenda and the checkout i can imagine um the, the checkout being off recording again i also think though there's something here um and i'm also drawn i guess to the experience of decoding these yarns if you like or presenting these yarns which are not books um they're very oral and they're calling on you know, deep intersections between people who are literally on opposite sides of the globe. There's something about the listener, the person who wasn't there, trying to understand a little bit about where those people come from. Um, and whether whether we have to do that or not, because if you you know, if you do a check-in as human, you've got 25 people on the call. That's actually the call. <laughs> and in fact, probably most of the time we're checking in as humans all the time. <laughs> it's like, I'm reading this book. Um, and I bumped into so-and-so. So, -and -so. so all the time we're bringing in things that represent us, but we're not necessarily giving people much of a chance to know who we are and why we see this book in this way or why we're interacting with it. You know, somebody say, why would you read more than one book at once? I'm, I'm the wanderer. I go between different communities and it makes a huge difference that I do. To myself, it makes me sort of more peaceful. But you wouldn't know that unless I said that about myself. <laughs> and even then, you know, I need to stick to my knitting sometimes. <laughs> well, I'm curious to know from people if maybe this is sort of a, a, a middle of the, the call check in question of what drew you to read this book? I mean, for me, I've always been fascinated by the fact that, you know, according to um, biology, humans in 
modern Homo sapiens, sapiens form have been around for about 250, 300,000 years, something like that. And as, a, as the genus Homo, we've been around for three to five million years. And yet we know maybe if we're lucky and educated about 5,000 years worth of our, our history. So, you know, I was drawn to this book because they're talking about 30,000 years of history. I'm like, wow, I'm going to, I get six times the amount of history I already have, you know, and <laughs> that's, that was a really big draw for me as I'm really fascinated. I, I keep, and I use Australian Aboriginal culture a lot in that my reading is that anthropologists have studied their stories and identified they still tell stories about animals who went extinct 40,000 years ago. So they have an intact culture for at least 40,000 years, probably longer than that. And I look around the world and I go, how many people have 40,000 years worth of cultural history to draw upon? And it's not very many. And what could we learn? How could we improve our memory? How can we go back uh, and harvest what might be dormant in there. I did this amazing process with Joanna Macy about 25 years ago outside in a, in a field where um, she had us with our eyes closed walking backwards and she read back from time. You know, when you arrived here or this morning breakfast last night and just until we were actually standing, we were emerging from the forest to stand on savannas of Africa. And then we moved forward and she said, any time you're moving forward and you find a gift, pick it up and carry it with you. This is harvesting the gifts of the ancestors. Um, and, and that was an incredibly powerful imaginal experience of actually feeling like, wow, I've, I, and something very interesting happened to me right around um, 1500, where this huge burden lifted off of my, my psyche. And it was so freeing. Like I felt a whole different way of being. And then to go back to, to being, you know, aboriginals on the plains and and you know wherever just having that experience was was very mind expanding for me and i wish more people had the opportunity to get outside of last week's news and next next quarter's profits and really get into what's going on here you know we're part of this grand sweep of humanity that has been going on for three million years what's our part in this well it's really interesting i took for my many my many sins i ran in um a nightclub in melbourne with a guy who does a sort of shamanic drumming <laughs> and a group of people and including a futurist and some of my friends a process where we walk people through their immediate sort of past to their immediate future and we we actually filmed it three-dimensional with a guy who is a, a a very talented videographer so we have i still have footage of this particular experience and I set it up because I was the person who ran it and it was advertised in Melbourne, across Melbourne. Um, so it was known as an event. And it was amazingly moving just to work through the small segment of your life that was immediately behind you and in front. Just to put that in motion as a spatial experience was life changing, let alone doing it over, you know, the parts of that are not accessible to me. This is me and my life and actually moving through it as a physical being with sound of drumming and such, which my friend uses. Um, but his first job was being a, some, negotiating with Somalian warlords out of uni. That's what he did for the UN. You go to uni, you go to uni and you finish your job and you get a job with the UN and you negotiate with Somalian warlords. So this is a deeply experienced person mm -hmm. who has spent lots of his life in Brazil and knows a lot about, you know, Brazil and the, the cultures in Brazil and, and he's fluent in multiple languages and he's a deeply useful person. So he used the drumming as a way of helping us access the rhythm of our lives, if you like, going back a little bit and going forwards a little people. Most people don't get experiences like we gave people in that nightclub. Most people wouldn't even think remotely of doing something like that. <laughs> but it was a, it was a privilege. And, you know, to do that as a group of people, I would so love to do that with a thousand people in a football field. Yeah. I would, yeah. And that's where I was going with this. And to use um, tools like SenseMaker and that to help people access some of the, the imagination that you could actually walk forwards together doing something different if you just decided you were going to do it, which was that, that was the message in the room. It's like, here it is, it's a future cone. It's a structure used in future as work. Um, here's a way you can structure your sort of close-up opportunities. 
you can imagine what's just behind you because it was yesterday or a week ago or whatever. And here's what it's opening up to. This is a choice that we are making together and I am also making as an individual. It is not set. But to make that a spatial play with people in a sort of flow state because of the drumming and other things, to say it's not actually preordained. You do have choices. You walk to the left, you go up high, you go low. It's a game that you play with yourself and with other people. It was really interesting to see how people wove in between, like they started to make little games, like we go down low or high, or you go between someone's legs, or you put a hand out somewhere and you just freeze because you didn't know what to do. So it was, um, so this book, you know, um, Dawn of Everything is making the premise that people have been doing experiments, like where they move through space and how they remember things, which is often spatially, because you didn't have necessarily the way of writing things down. So Aboriginal people use, you know, a rock to remember something or a story which is evoked by a rock to remember something. Um, and this long, a song line is like, it's like a story that you use to get from A to B. You know, the story, when you get to this point in the story, you will see these objects in your environment and orientate and then the next part of the story is how you get to the next series of objects. So they're actually like books. The song line is like a book. Mm. So anyway, if you can turn your life into something like that, that's more spatial and accessible and got this freedom, it takes you out of the bind and the jam of I only have X in front of me. And Judy's joined us. Hey, Judy. Apologies for uh, having a cluttered calendar. <laughs> no You're apology welcome. necessary. Um, Thanks, thanks for being here. Good to see you, Judy. Nice to see you too. Um, Judy, I'll put the link in the, to this document in the chat, but you can just watch the screen if you want. That's perfect, thank you. The, the, Ken was asking us, why did we read that, choose to read that book? I don't know if you want to go. Yeah, I'd love to hear your answers. Mm. I used to want to be an archaeologist when I was little. <laughs> and then David, I skipped decades and decades and decades of stuff, but I did a lot of things in it. And then the only reason I knew about this book was Marc Antoine and you and David Bovel were saying you should read this book. This book is really good. So I got the book and I walk in nature and I read, I listened to the book. Um, and other things are happening. So now I'm drawn into the book, but I used to want to be an archaeologist. When I was I remember what got me into it. But Judith, I was curious to have your take on this. Well, first of all, I'm a book fiend. My house will collapse under the weight of books. <laughs> um, in fact, there's a funny story about that some other time I'll share. Um, but what drawn, drew me to the book really was the dual perspective of the two authors, the, the sort of scientific foundation of artifacts and what the artifacts mean in the context of time and the social aspect of an anthropologist looking at how species interact. And many anthropologists are broader than just the human species. And so I was intrigued by the notion of sort of the ascent of species <laughs> from the horizon of early time. And then where I like to go with those things is well, what does that, what are the implications of that perspective or that understanding on how I view my life right now? And what are the things that I can and can't influence or change or want to preserve and how might I do that? It's not a fast read, however, <laughs> because I find that I may need to do the audio as well as the book, because when I read a book, I stop all the time and think about the last two sentences <laughs> and it's that kind of a book.
Um, I, I mean to have a wiki page called Big Questions, um, and that that's a good one. Which is so that's why I, I wrote this here. I I started reading the book partly because I've heard heard about it over and over and over in OGM, and at some point you go, okay, well, <laughs> I guess I guess this is the book I need to read. The, the other thing is, and it's, it's funny, I, I ended up being a little bit embarrassed um, by, the, by, the, by the chapter one Rousseau Hobbes thing. Um, at, at some point in the past two, three, four years, something like that, um, uh, enough things clicked. It was probably, uh, uh, it was probably debt, the first 5,000 years, and Jerry talking about um, the grain book. Which which one is that? Wheat, grain, something. Weaving, weaving sweet grass, braiding sweet no, grass. No, but no? a different one. Um, uh, I'll have to think about it for a sec. Uh, anyway, something kind of clicked, and then I, I saw a through line. Um, so I, I, for a long time, after reading a book called uh, Global Blaine by Howard Bloom, and then uh, also uh, Lucille's. Lucy's Legacy by Alison Jolly. Um, uh, Jolly's book says that humans are just primates. Um, if she was a primatologist, and if you study primates enough, you go, yep, <laughs> humans are no different than any other primates. Um, so that that kind of like poked a poked a hole for me in the in the bubble of humanity being you know super special or anything anything like that. Um, she she ends the book. She kind of starts off with maybe I, I've, it's been a long time since I've read it. I I know she ends the book looking towards the future and kind of it led me into kind of where the Global Brain book picked up. Howard Bloom, who wrote Global Brain, is he's kind of a pseudo scientific author. Um, he writes sciencey kinds of books, but I think he's more of, more of a layperson, so he gets kind of a bad rap. But Global Brain also was a real big kick in the rear. Um, uh, and what he argues is that everything is a brain. Um, the universe is a brain. Um, a bacteria is a brain. Humans, humans are, individual humans have a brain. And then, you know, humans together in society act as a brain. And um, one of the things that really struck me out of that book was uh, he, he emphasized group selection as an important thing for social animals, not just individual selection. So when I grew up and learned about Darwinian selection, it was like, well, the zebras are, are more efficient and blah, blah, blah. A, a zebra is more efficient than what other kind of animal came before it, you know, on this, in this context. He said, you know, especially with social animals, you end up with, and, and this was striking and, and hard for people to hear at the time he wrote the book, you end up with the society of zebras being the thing that natural selection acts on. Any one particular zebra isn't important to um, the, the, the uh, survival of the whole. And actually, you end up with situations where you suboptimize individual um, survival to enhance group selection. Um, so kind of all of that, another, another touch point for me was uh, John Perry Barlow's uh, essay. Uh, it's called, it, It's a Poor Workman Who Blames His Tools. Um, he coins a thing called humanity itself. And he says, um, I, look at, I look at our life today and I look at my mom's life or maybe my grandma's life back in the plains or something like that. We are living completely different worlds. And somehow we got from there to thinking of humanity itself as composed of individual humans, the way that um, the way that a human body has a lot of mitochondria in it. Like, you know, uh, from the, the human point of view, where this or from a from a human individual, we think of ourselves as one cohesive whole. But when you take the system apart, you know, there's a whole microbiome of bacteria and there's a whole set of mitochondria that got swept into cells some millions of years ago. So he's like individual humans kind of, I think they're kind of like mitochondria. Mitochondria don't know anything about, oh, they live in a dog or they live in a cow or they live in a human. They just go about their mitochondrial life, you know, doing stuff. And he's like, I think individual humans are kind of like that as related to this humanity itself thing. 
So for all of that, I'm interested in where we go from here. How do we make the world a better place? How do we be make uh, people more equitable and stuff like that? And so, you know, I somehow got that kind of shared history now after reading chapter one that uh, we started off as pastoralists kind of. Um, we invented agriculture, we invented uh, surplus grains. We have to have administrative stuff and different classes to administer surpluses. And then you end up with taxes and cities and religions and, and uh, feudalism and capitalism and stuff like that. That's the history so, the debunks. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. However, yeah. and this is why I'm embarrassed. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. You know, I, 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 have, I have subscribed to the debunked history. However, I think it's a little bit different than that. Um, uh, because, and forgive me for getting it wrong, uh, I, I haven't read all the book yet, um, but we, we have ended up in one fork, one path of the, of the branch, right? We've ended up at a place. And if you work backwards, I, I don't have the feeling, I never had the feeling that it was one thing building on another thing inevitably towards you know, our beautiful current future. What I was thinking is our, our future has been a series of natural selection events amongst bigger and bigger uh, social structures. So a social structure that's a, a, a city, city state is more powerful essentially than the pastoralists living around it. Um, and it's, I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it's an advancement or a hierarchical thing, but I also think it's true that natural selection ended up, natural selection on social structures and then larger and larger scale social structures until we got things like cap feudalism and capitalism, massive social structures, massive emergent, hyper complex social structures that we think we understand and we don't. Um, uh, and I think that's how we ended up where we are. Not that one is better than the other. And especially I think of, I think of the winners that we are now, the hype, you know, post capitalism at this point. Um, it's the people who were the most warlike, who were able to kill all the other kinds of cultures um, and actually leave us literally physically, biologically evolving uh, into a people that, you know, that write books like Steven Pinker writes and write books like Jared Diamond writes. They have a hard time even imagining a different kind of culture, right? And it's a biological thing, actually. We've gotten to the point where we're survivors of, we're the survivors of the wars. We're not the, you know, the, the, the people who got wiped out. And so I was always sad thinking, I'll bet there was an amazing variety. So the, the happy thing you know, that I, I hope to read into the rest of the book with, I'm sure there was an amazing variety of different kinds of so, uh, societies. And systematically, the winning super scale social structure has essentially wiped out a lot of those things. And now you know, we're in some kind of post thing where we're trying to recover that and trying to regenerate that. So, so that's why I wanted to read the book to see how it turned out in the end. I... It's not the end though yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Soon enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of themes I, that resonate with me, but I'd like to pick up on a few of those. Uh, I One big question I've kept asking myself is the question of uh, cooperation versus competition. Mm. And adaptation has been towards more cooperation as well as competition. Both forces are part of the adaptive forces. Um, and the other one is, you, you know, that you say, oh, we ended up in this way and how much of that was unavoidable, how much of that was predetermined by human nature. And how much was just an accident of history, right? And I don't feel I have an answer to that. Uh, I don't think the book has an answer to that. I, I, I think a lot of that kind of stuff, okay. a, a lot of emergence is, is accidental. Um, it, you know. I, I, I believe so as well. I do think that 
when you say, is it because we were the ones who uh, outcompeted? Yeah, uh, and, 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 and Diamond gets a lot of, of uh, knuckle wraps in this book, but the basic idea of, you know what, the, the question of we had more germs because uh, we had more, uh, we shared our lives with more animals because it was possible to do it because of the east-west axis of the continent. I don't think that got debunked. Uh, I still buy that story personally. <laughs> yeah. I think the environment has a lot to do with it, though, and that comes out quite clearly in Graeber's book. And, you know, I, I know I come from a background of environmental design, but, you know, cold has an impact. If you have to hibernate for X amount of time a year, you know, yeah. you're going to think differently because you've got to have social structures that support you not killing each other when you're living indoors for that amount of time. You have to have social structures that allow you when it's summer to go out and be brave and not kill each other, but go and kill the animal instead that you can bring back and cure together, which also requires some cooperation so that when you're locked indoors again, so these power structures and Graeber really makes this point, And I've heard this in lots of different places. Dave Snowden says the same thing is that you need to be able to decompose and recompose the ingredients. And one of my big yeah, one of my big concerns is that we are rapidly reducing the number of items that we have to work with from the environment to weave and reweave. So when you get a student who never knows what a tree is because they don't see trees, they don't live trees, they don't put their feet on grass, a tree is not a thing in your brain. It's not a word that you have. You can't braid with those ingredients. If those words are not there, you can't respect those things. And you live in the, the pattern that you were boxed into, you know, it's a bit like that compactus where the sides come in. So in theory, you can have this richness of thought, but the thought actually comes from exper experiencing the environment. You know, no, the you idea of all, yeah. I wasn't done. <laughs> no, sorry. sorry. Uh, but I agree totally with what you're saying. The, the, the question of what you're working with, of course, limits your imagination. But the whole question of, how much is of competition is ingrained in, in the human brain and how much is something we learn and how much is it uh you know destiny and how much of it is freedom and how much of it this this is what this is the big question we have right now that we're in a path to self-destruction <laughs> we we want to know this and and right now the the link between scarcity and aggression is there but there's many factors of aggression uh i keep quoting Canefield uh, in other contexts, I think. Uh, Canefield is very much quoting this other person that, that was the last free Jerry's brain, sorry, trying to remember the name of the other author, uh, saying, you know, there's 30% give or take people who are more uh, attracted by authoritarian government than the hard work of negotiating with other human beings. Uh, mm -hmm. They want. They prefer being told what to do. Uh, is that thirty percent innate or acquired? I don't believe it's acquired. It's it's innate myself. Uh, is it? But I may be wrong. Uh, but what I what I do feel is the time of evolution of G uh, uh, when genes change is very slow. Like it takes a lot of time to gene drift, for gene drift to accumulate into a permanent modification, even a population rate modification. It takes many generations. So I've always been suspicious of the sociobiology claim that you can explain, like you can correlate social orders with uh, behavioral propensities because there's actually a huge amount of genetic mix in human populations. We sleep around a lot <laughs> and uh, we exchange genes faster than we change society, social orders, uh, or, or at least at the rate that offsets the rate of change of social orders. I think, I, maybe wrong. I, I agree with that kind of in the steady state, but I also think that we've, when, when big social structures commit genocide, that changes the the rate of change of evolution. Mm -hmm. 
It's possibly true, but that supposes that the two populations were terribly different to start with, which is what I'm not sure about. But yeah. hey, I'm not sure. It's complicated. It, and it's, it's, it's uh, what I'm sure about is we need to bloody understand those dynamics. Yes, what about epigenetics? Epi epigenetics does change things. You're absolutely right, Wendy. Uh, and yes, absolutely true. The, the, the genocide of, yes, totally with you there. Um, we need to understand those dynamics. We need to understand what's possible, how things become possible, how to make things possible, uh, but, but especially the field of the possible. Uh, given the humans we are now. <laughs> and I dare hope it's not just the authoritarian future and the uh, collapse future. And I, at this point, I see collapse as inevitable, but how much of a collapse and how much space for, you know, something else to happen in the margins. <laughs> um, with that, I'm going to interrupt this uh, with my moderator hat on. Yeah, I'm done. Um, uh, we've got uh, five minutes left in our 90 minutes. Um, I, I would like to propose that we try to keep the 90 minutes, uh, these calls, and train ourselves to, to, to do that, um, even though I would love to keep talking for another 20. Um, does that sound OK? Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to make a practice of doing uh, retros, at least. And so maybe we can do five, four minutes of retro and then maybe hang out for five or 10 minutes and do our human checkout off, off recording and get a little bit more um, a little bit more time that way without having it count against our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so this call, uh, let's talk about how this call went. Uh, what went well? And I'm gonna try to take notes. Everything. <laughs> 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 That's great. I got no complaints. I, I, I just, to me, this is this is the kind of, you know, emergent, chaotic, lovely, meandering, yarning conversation that I, I really enjoy. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not looking so much for structure. I just feel really good about everything that's been said here. Um, can I, can I, can I telescope everything into the people? No. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, the interaction. Well, well every, yeah, um, you can say the the content, the process, the the people, um, the unfolding, um, the emergent. The, there's a slightly chaotic element to it. There was interruptions and tangents, and so it just felt to me very, very human. Like you know, this is how people actually sit around and talk. Yeah, and and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the intelligence of every one of us here, because it just, it really nourishes me to be in this type of conversation. Um, do we, do we want to add more about what went well? well uh, I'm going to add uh, taking notes. <laughs> yes. Pete always always goes well in these conversations. He's a phenomenal record keeper and scribe. I, I always appreciate that about you, Pete. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think we did a good job of working together too as a team. So I'm really happy with that. And we also slowed down a little bit um, to look books up or you know capture things well. So. Mm. I'm happy we got to talk at least a little bit about the book. <laughs> <laughs> we did mention the title a couple of times. <laughs> I, I, I feel I like we talked about it a fair bit. Uh, I went into grand overview mode rather than the chapter. But we also mm. managed to mention the chapter a few times. <laughs> I, I, I think one of the other things is that um, it would actually change the nature of this book of the book is, you know, the, the width of the context that we're providing is, I guess, what every human, if integrated into the David's writing might, it could have been a bigger book, it's already a big book, but there's something about the richness that of all the bits and pieces that we've said are relevant, that we're evoked in. Oh no, when he froze, I think. Yeah, froze for me too. 
start the, start the other section meanwhile what did um, we go i'm going to capture one more talking about uh dawn of everything in context of uh, other books and materials wendy if you can hear us you're frozen maybe try turning your video off and see if that brings you back for audio okay now delta what would we do differently next time can I pop in for just a second um, before we go to Delta? And, and that would be that the scope of the context from infinite to minute and the able, being able to travel across that scope to dig in into the minutia and to what some people would call artifacts and then for me, the other piece that's important and I'm feeling very sad that I missed part of the conversation is, is just the, the ability of different people. And I think I'd expand that to different species and social organizations, because I don't think we understand the sophisticated communication that goes on in non-human social organizations. Um, the, the ability to go over that wide continuum and then home in and dive paradoxically perpendicular to the continuum into a specific zone of depth is a really intriguing ability. And I don't know how much of it is observational and how much of it is constructive in formative ways. I wonder if you could make that into a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can even remember what I said. Um, the, the, there's a, uh, the intersection there's of very a lot broad, of, broad yeah. perspective with high levels of detail at specific points would be one bullet. Um, the internalization and externalization of observations and actions would be another. And I, I'd like to explore why we think it's just humans who do that. <laughs> because I think part of our evolution as humans is to realize that there might be other groups of identities that are non-human from whom we could learn. Um, thanks, Judy. Um, I'm always a little, little conscious um, of sharing the screen and taking away, you know, making faces small instead of the screen. I, I feel like we know each other well enough that even a thumbnail is, is helpful. And I think sharing the screen helped a lot in keeping the, what do we think about that? Uh, that's actually why I asked you to bump up the Zoom yeah. to 125% so I could broaden out the thumbnail so I could get a pretty good sense they were not quite as small. So that's that worked for me in terms of the screen, but that would not work so well if we had more than five people would because then it would just, you know, anyway, yep. that's. I, I do like having a live note taking going on. Um, yeah, I find that very useful and at the same time, it is sometimes distracting because I'm trying to listen to somebody. I look at a note and I'll, I'll go, oh, damn, I lost what you were saying. So that's just my own brainwaves, you know, interfering with each other. Um, for, for what it's worth, and maybe this works with your neurology or, and not, um, I've got the, you've seen me copying and pasting from the live transcript. So I actually, there were times when I missed, you know, 30 seconds of, of something and I could read it back on the transcript. Um, but that means that I've got a web browser and this browser and the transcript and the chat and I'm <laughs> processing all of that, which yeah. your mileage may vary. Um, about Pete. What about when Pete's, um, and I made a little attempt, it's, I tried to do it when Pete's talking, he's obviously thinking about talking, he's not typing at the same time. So there's something yeah. about Pete's thoughts that need to be explicitly captured because he does such a, a great job of capturing everybody else's stuff and you offer some really great
great thoughts and I'd want some agreement between us that what Pete says is also captured, even if it's just roughly. Um, maybe that's just an explicit agreement because you're part of the conversation, Pete, not just a person who's recording it. And the beauty of the live transcript is Pete can go back and grab what he said and paste it in. <laughs> but when you do it, it's the point. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot it of work. It comes to work, though. Hmm. Folks, I do have to leave. Sorry. Mark Antoine, Thanks, really nice to fun. see you. It's been a while. Yes, yeah, great. Well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Take, take care. See, see you soon. Bye. Uh, I would, I would also, uh, we went a little over time. <laughs> I'd like to sort of reflect on, I guess, the notes that you've taken, Pete, and then this book on dialogue and thinking together. Because I know this weaving together in wikis is important. And I notice the opportunity because we're making these web pages much too slowly for my making, but just know that the fact that you're taking these notes, if, if we were to make this conversation into a web page or something, I'm not saying we would, but if we had David Wengro here, we probably would. <laughs> and a more structured conversation. Um, so there's something here about the value of having that um, a greater depth. And I, I think I've, I've always lost where I've gone here. Um, yeah, I think I've lost my thread. But it's something about the weaving turning up with the names and such and the quotes and other bits and pieces that make the whole conversation more accessible. Um, and it would almost be important, I think, maybe if we wanted to take that into the conversation. Oh, that's right, dialogue in the book. So there's something about looking at the, the pattern of this conversation that we've just had around a prompt, which is a very specific prompt, which is a book and very specific part of it, and where that conversation went and actually looking at the structure, you know, where we handed the baton. I know I spoke too much or I feel like I did. Um, Ken, you know, you weren't as dominant in the conversation, but very valued. And Pete, likewise, Judy was a late joiner. There's something about the structure of the conversation and noticing the pattern of that and understanding how we could improve on it or just appreciating the pattern um, that we could then bring into our next structure, make sure that it wasn't too squishy. Because I think the fact that we brought in these very disparate external things and some stories and bits and pieces you know Yoko Ono wasn't going to be there but you know she was in my week and it's a very valid point this objective thing the object thing is really really important in trying to do what's happening so um to have those things represented is quite important and that for some people would be irreverent me bringing in that story is irreverent in this conversation. I felt like I was brave doing it. But what I was trying to do was to teach a, creep, a group of people who are trying to change the course of artificial intelligence in the world, including Silicon Valley, who have been trained by one of Silicon Valley's darlings, Australian darlings, Genevieve Bell, to do just that. And I was talking to those people in service of that working well. So it's, it's not an interruption. It's right at the core of what we're trying to achieve together. But it felt like an interruption. It felt like I was telling the story and maybe nobody got that story. Maybe that's a better question. Maybe I needed to have that as a piece that I could bring in and say, here's a little, um, here's a story that, was done in service of a very large objective, which is to change the future of artificial intelligence across the planet, which is arguably a very important extension of dawn of everything, literally. <laughs> but it happened in my world within the last week. <laughs> and how do we bring things like that in 
in a way that's reverent to the group? Do we turn that into a separate conversation? Do I import my PowerPoint slide that says how I did it? Do I just ignore it because I feel like it doesn't fit? I'd really like your um, responses. The, the, uh, uh, so Bill and I at least have an intent to, we've, we've got a wiki website already. Um, this, this notes page and the machine transcript will go up on that. Um, uh, I've already been putting double square brackets in for at least books and things like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think Wendy, the, the thing to do is maybe, maybe we'll see this happen. Maybe we won't, but, um, we have at least a few people have an intent to grow this into a wiki website. Um, and then a perfect way to weave in the, you know, kind of the footnote thoughts that are kind of important, you know, they're maybe in some ways they're not footnotes would be uh, afterwards to add that. Um, Bill's already got stuff in, in the website. Um, Mm. Uh, he's he started adding a few things, not a lot of things. Um, uh, but uh, I th I think the way to do it is is uh, it's funny he captured this, this, which is something that I said. Um, uh, but it's in bounds, I think, and 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 important mm. and proper uh, to to continue this conversation into the wiki, and so that's where I would go with yeah. that. Thank you. But yeah, and, and I guess just to have it for the record, you know, this whole body of work, um, which may not even be referenced in this conversation, whether I feel confident or not. Um, and if now that I know that it could be evoked as a, a footnote or in the wiki, we might need some sort of shorthand to say, you know, I'd love to tell the story of, and maybe this is one for the wiki. There's a lot yeah, the, of and the, the that. way to do that. Um, I've kind of done that, you know, throughout here. Um, I don't know that I actually annotated anything, but this is this is a place where, you know, this is going to be a wiki page. This thing. Um, yeah. And you know, it, it's it's perfect to say to to either tell the note taker or or just type yourself. Um, you know, Wendy's story about you know, something like that. Yeah. And then that and would then, turn to a link about, um, you know, SOSI, the society, the school of cybernetics at ANU and how they're yep. wanting to change the path of artificial intelligence into the planet, which yep. is a dawn ending yep. thing. If you want to call it dawn of everything, it's a, it's a sunset thing, really, if you think about it. So it's yep. really yep. important, but, and it was really important in my world, but maybe other people don't have to appreciate that. And to me, that would make me feel extremely sad. And I'd say, what are we bothering? Why are we, why are we having these conversations if we can't involve bringing these big conversations in, which could be extraordinarily useful, but if they don't have a little entry point somewhere. Anyway, Yoko, I know, and yes. <laughs> Giving ourselves permission to do things. So I gave myself permission and I told a story that probably didn't make sense to the, the people gathered, except for Pete knew about it. And a couple of you helped me prepare that activity and it went very well. It involved a ladder. Thanks, Wendy. Judy? There's, I had a question and I don't know how to express this. So what, I apologize for the fumbling. There's a sense of almost unlimited multidimensionality <laughs> to what we're talking mm. about. Mm. And, and when you think about any particular point of conversation, you can think about how you got there, where you go from there, um, mm. what it connects to, what are the implications, this, this sort of unlimited dimensionality of every aspect of life and of every aspect of life's sense of those dimensionalities, what are intrinsic, what are genetic, what are ideological, what are behavioral, which is the sort of anthropological look at it. I mean, I guess I'm just, trying to tease apart all of the different dimensions of behavior and adaption that mm -hmm. occur as systems grow. I think it's really important you've just said that because 
you know, how do you do the weaving? Um, because the weaving is just a selection of all of those dimensions at any point in time as represented. And if we put another three people into this conversation, it's a different conversation if they speak. If they don't speak, we're limiting our options. But sometimes someone not speaking is actually a good move. Um, and sometimes asking a person to dominate the conversation is actually a useful move, but then you miss, it's all choices, you know, who speaks up. And I guess that's what I was actually saying about, you know, society of um, the school of cybernetics is like, that is the in explicit intention of that thing. And it's a large dimension. It's not a small dimension. You know, that's the impact it seeks. It's only one university into, you know, and Intel and Microsoft and a few other little players around the place. <laughs> so it's a, it's a small entry point to a large thing. But if you look at that, so is the idea of being a rock, a person as a rock and thinking of myself as equal as a rock. That's a small item in a large thing. And one was representing the other. So at some point, there's a, almost like a zeitgeist that you've got to say, and you, you named a zeitgeist, which is, it's a universal truth in knowledge that it's all to do with the perceiver and that moment in time of perception. And two seconds earlier and two seconds later, it's actually a different thing. <laughs> so we, we, you can't nail this. And I think it's always important to know that it's environmental and it's, it's evoked by that person in that moment and those senses. And, but there's something about at the moment, everyone's agreeing that there's something to account for and something to move towards and maybe something to move away from that is helpful. I think this notion of multidimensionality that's mm. situational is important mm. because at any at any instant you can go broad, you can go deep, you can do combining, you can do sorting. There's an infinite number of options that sort of in sci-fi would say, well then you hop to the alternate universe of X. <laughs> yeah. And and that's the 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 question that that I'm intrigued to try to explore in order to personally selfishly be able to look wisely at a moment in time yes. and, and discern how I might elect to deal with that moment in time. So I would commend to people the book that I'm reading at the moment, which is called Dialogue um, in parallel. Um, I'll give you the name of the book because I think it helps us discern where the energy is at a moment in time and physics comes into a lot of this stuff um, because there's something about staying with this tension between ourselves about what we would like to pay attention to so it's called isaac will um it's by yeah, a guy isaacs yeah dialogue the art of thinking together mm. and pete i think there's something here about massive wiki and, and getting people's attention, and this comes back to cybernetics and Randolph Glanville, it's it's not a deep focus, but it's a, where is our attention landing at the moment? And can we give that attention enough attention to make something of it so that we've got something to work from? So it's not about, saying that we have to talk about objects as objects, but I do think that there is absolutely an important point to discuss through, you know, a, a observer, observer object is a really important thing for us to lightly pay attention to, to decide whether there can be a subject in conversation or is taking the eye out of the conversation a really important step. I argued that it was. I, I can't, imagine taking myself out of a conversation I imagine the activity of trying to do it <laughs> and the difficulty in doing that but you know that's if you're going to use some of these whole realms of knowledge like indigenous knowledge my point was that you actually have to turn yourself you have to try and turn yourself into a rock or a tree and if you can't do that that only allows certain options in front of you it's like a gate to a certain extent I don't have 70,000 years behind me of trying to be a tree or being a river or being a rock. I find that very hard to do, but I sort of feel like I need to do it. And I think I'm right on this. If I can't do that, that means that I have to be 
you know, powerful in the situation. That means only certain things can happen for me. I don't want the outcome of those things. So there's something about reaching deep into myself. I, I'm, uh, let me jump in. Uh, I think I did a decent job at capturing, need to work on how to include a big important story that doesn't fit into the meeting format. And I, I think, I humbly believe I'm on the right track with the, uh, the wiki. Um, so then maybe the, the meeting format is an interesting thing. So a, a part that's unspecified there um, is the meeting format. And I think it's like, I, I think the topic of the meeting is kind of the chapter of the book and maybe a little bit broader than that, the book, and maybe a little bit broader than that stuff right around the book. And Wendy, I think it's awesome that there are big ideas to connect to that um, and they should be talked about. So the way to connect it to the meeting and to the, the book club is to, you know, make a link, make a wiki page, make a couple wiki pages. And then another thing to do, I think, is not to try to shoehorn those footnotes that turned into like whole conversations, not to try to shoehorn that into the meeting format that we've got for the, the book club, mm. but rather convene another call, right? Mm. Let's talk about um, the future of artificial intelligence as relates to Dawn of, of Everything. And Ooh. Some people will, will go, oh my God, that's why I'm reading the book. And some people will go, I'm sorry, that's not me. I'm you know, all about conversations and I don't care about artificial intelligence. So I think, I, I think, so there's two things here. One of them is it's really important when other conversations bubble up to like make a little mark and you know, capture the intention to do more of that. And also, to let go of the fact that we don't need to talk about it here, we need to yeah. talk about it in another call. And I think, I hope we, we end up generating more calls out of, out of these conversations. Yeah, and I also think with my experience with um, Water Choices, which was um, a website that was created at a conversation, there's a, a pattern around where that goes. It's like little starbursts. So the original conversation is like, you know, when, Nora Bateson met Dave Snowden and these other two people at this particular time. And then you keep on coming back to that conversation and its implications and you richen and deepen that one conversation. You don't try and spawn 50 other conversations back on you. You keep on circling back and, and really, really tracing that as an impact in, and for the people who watch it and then look at it and really develop a community around that particular thing. So you create an artifact of value, which I think we could now do, you know, what, oh, oh, David Wengro meets person X, Y, okay? And it could be Elon Musk and Genevieve Bell or whatever, I don't know. And then deepen that, but keep on coming back to that conversation and its value rather than leaping away. Uh, yes, yes, and, um, and I would yeah. observe that some people will be interested in that new conversation that is butted, butted off yeah. and should continue to revolve around it. And yeah. other people in our group will go, it's not my conversation. I've got a different one that I'm involved in. And that's the one I'm, I'm going to revolve around. Yeah. So I think and, yeah, we're, we're all together around the book and then we're gonna have to allow you know, other conversations with a subset of the people and maybe other additional people to butt out of them. I wonder if there's a concept that, that I've found useful before of, of point analysis in terms of breadth and depth. Because at mm. any point in a conversation, you can choose to go very deep and explore that point. Or you can say, well, that point is like these other seven points in very different arenas. That, yeah. that spatial representation as an intellectual approach would allow us to help define dimensions to explore. Yeah, and there's something about conversation analysis a la um, oh, and Conklin, Jeff Conklin, to say that, yes, we've brought that general issue up. So if you say mining and um, land ownership, for example, um, at some point we can say, I think 
we could come back to this and there will be some people who will do that for us. We now need to recognize that that's another point underneath this item. And while that could diverge further at the moment, we'll just recognize that, you know, land entitlement is to do with what has these, at least these dimensions. And now we want to focus on this other part of the tapestry and work more deeply with that and see where that goes. So you get this more, and Jeff Conklin's got some structure around that. He's got seven different question types. It's a really good book to listen to. It's talking about decisions in some ways or making sure you've got a landscape in which a decision could be made and a way of reverently saying your idea is up on the wall. Um, and therefore, is it another point that you're making to this idea which changes it to a, what's called a left-hand move? Is it another question we're addressing? I love the way you did that, Judy, because I felt when I talked about, you know, Yoko Ono and such, I, I, I didn't feel like it was self-serving. There was something behind it which was actually deeply important, but I, I didn't have a clean way of introducing it because it felt too modern for our conversation. It wasn't part of David's the David Squared's book, but intuitively I knew it was important. And so having other people's view, maybe me saying something, you know, I've got a short story to share about um, cybernetics, a modern version of cybernetics and changing the path of human history with AI. How do you want me to deal with that? <laughs> You can say, no, we want to hear your story. Or can we put that as a tab to explore later because that's a really important conversation. And then I would feel acknowledged and that's what Jeff Conklin's stuff does. I would feel like that doesn't have to be pushed in. And I, I, yeah. I think, um, so, so a thing to do is to ask that question Right, Wendy, it's, you know, I, I want to tell a story and is it okay if I tell a story? Um, another thing that you could do um, even um, is, uh, is either ask the note taker, hey, could you make a note about the story that's going to remind me of the story, maybe nobody else, yeah. so that I can bring that story to the group asynchronously, yeah. right? Um, you, could, you could also type that uh, into the notes. So you actually kind of had the it, ingredients, but I just didn't act that way. Well, I, it, <laughs> and I, I, no, don't be sorry. Um, there's nothing to be sorry for, but, um, but you can actually, there's, act. there's a, ni a nice thing of acknowledging being heard, right? Um, I have an important thing this and I want to, I want to say it and having people but then there's also, if it's a big enough thing, it's not going to fit into the conversation. You can, the cool thing about the way that we're doing the asynchronous notes and ultimately, hopefully the wiki is that you can put a fingerprint in it and, you know, you can make the fingerprint bigger and bigger. Um, and so you own this, you own this document as much as anybody else. And you've mm. got the capability um, to make a dent in it. So do we want to take this as instance one, have a look at the shape of the conversation, you know, just lightly, you know, allow this conversation between dialogue and um, William Isaac's book, Dialogue, The Art of Thinking Together, and Jeff Conklin, <laughs> because they, they seem, Jeff Conklin's one's more around a dialogue that, that heads towards a conversation and mapping that conversation. I, I have a funny answer too? for you. Um, yes. Uh, the answer, I think, is that it doesn't fit in the the meeting format that we've got for the book circle. And I am passionately interested in you um, uh, asking that question as a question in the Matmos channel, right? I think it's really important to talk about dialogue mapping and conversational analysis and and I have to say, I'm not sure that you would get any pickup on it. I think, or much pickup on it. I think we're all like packed already. Um, I I would love to dive into that um, that topic, and I don't feel like I have time in my life right now. 
Um, <laughs> but again, that's that's something that maybe what I would do is I wouldn't say I. So one of the things I would do is I would say, hey, I'm having a meeting next week. Here's the one to meet. I want to talk about dialogue mapping and conversational analysis and the shape of the conversations that we've already recorded. That's one thing I would do. Another thing I would do is essentially take a note to myself and to other people. I wrote up a wiki page that's all about, you know, what we could be doing or what we should be doing or, you know, a way that um, you write up that wiki page, um, you get it linked into the rest of the wiki and you post the link to, to chat. So that's a pattern I do. Um, uh, emergence event sense making is kind of that pattern, right? Where I had a great idea and I got to do a little bit of work on it and it's still kind of lying out there as work to do in the future. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, what happens is it comes around in, in a month or six months or whenever um, we might say, oh my gosh, we've got to start already on this dialogue mapping stuff. Let's, let's dig in. So on that note, I do need to step into my day and thank you for having that thought. And maybe you and I can make sure that I follow through on that because I feel it answers part of Judy's requirement mm -hmm. is that we need to understand what the nature of the pattern that has in that particular conversation, why we're having that particular version of it um, and whether we should be trying to make it focus more or come out or just reference bits of it that we can come back to later. But right now I have to disappear. Cheers. So, thank you for being here. And thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this. I think it's important. And thank you everyone for their, con their contributions because they're extraordinary. Bye, Wendy. Take care. I'll be excited to listen to the hour I missed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording and stop.